Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to be in Jeremiah chapters 20 through 52 and the book of Lamentations. This week's Come Follow Me is focusing on chapters 30 through 33 and 36 of Jeremiah and Lamentations chapters 1 and 3. Now, because Come Follow Me is addressing just a handful of chapters in a large setting, Mike and I are going to tackle this week kind of topically by theme and not necessarily go sequentially. You will, of course, read it sequentially, but hopefully our discussion of the topics will help you weave those topics throughout the sequence of the scriptures. But before we jump into those topics, it's always important, especially with Jeremiah, that we have a background understanding, that we know what's happening in Israel, who are the kings that are involved, what's the setting that's involved. So, Mike, walk us through the history, not just of Jeremiah, but of these particular chapters. Okay, so it's important to know that in the book of Jeremiah, there are basically five kings that we're dealing with during this time period. And the first king is Josiah. Josiah reigned from 640 to 609. He's killed at Megiddo by the Egyptians in 609. And so his son Jehoahaz takes the throne and is only on the throne for about nine months when the Pharaoh Necho deposes him. And so then Josiah's next son, Jehoiakim, he takes the throne and he is on the throne from 609 to 598 B.C., This is the individual that has a lot of interaction with Jeremiah in these chapters. This king is going to be the one that burns the scroll that Jeremiah prophesies on, and then Jeremiah's scribe Baruch writes the prophecy on the scroll, and Jehoiakim burns the scroll. This king will eventually rebel against Babylon, and then he will die in the siege that Babylon puts on the city of Jerusalem in 598. And then... For a brief time, like three months, Jehoiachin is his son. Also, his name is Kaniah or Jeconiah. He takes the throne from December to March of 598 to 597. And then when Babylon finally comes in, they take this king and they take him into captivity. And we read about it in 2 Kings 25, and he'll later be freed. This is the Davidic line that's preserved that we read about in Matthew chapter 1, verse 11. And then finally, when they take the city, when Babylon takes it, they put a puppet king, Mataniah, and they change his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah is the king on the throne from 597 to 586. And this is the king that is ruling in Jerusalem when Nephi gives us first Nephi, and he tells us the experience that he has living in Jerusalem. So to recap, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah, those three kings are son of Josiah, and Jehoiachin is a son of Jehoiakim. We'll put a graphic in the slides so you can see it and you can understand their relationships, but just know that Jeremiah is going to interact with these individual kings. He's going to prophesy of both attacks, the 598 siege that Babylon puts on Jerusalem and the siege in 586. So there's a couple of sieges in here. It's a difficult time for the people. And Jeremiah is going to be accused of being a traitor because he's going to tell the king, hey, if you guys will just surrender to the Babylonians and you will pay tribute and you will follow the rules, everything's going to go well. But if you don't, it's not going to work out. And then later, Jeremiah is going to say, you're going to go in captivity. They're going to win. So your best bet is to just do all you can to make it easy for them. And from their perspective, the people that rule the city, the princes, and the text goes on about, on and on about the princes and the prophets and the king, they look at Jeremiah as a traitor. And they basically say, how can you say these things? You are obviously siding with the enemy. And so for that, they're going to throw him in prison, and they're eventually going to throw him in a cistern or a dungeon where he's basically in a bunch of mud. And it's a horrible experience for Jeremiah, because imagine how alone you would feel in the bottom of a muddy pit. And that image of a prophet at the bottom of a muddy pit is a type of Christ, because Christ descended into the depths of hell 
to redeem all of us. And his message is one to the world to redeem us. And Jeremiah's message was really one of hope. He was really the best hope that the king had. And the king put him in a dungeon. And this kind of reminds me of Abinadi. And those of you that have read the story in Mosiah, you can see some very telling similarities between these two stories. I'd also like to point out that in our last podcast, we mentioned coloring Jeremiah with four different colors. I think if you look for four different themes and mark this with four different colors, you'll see how they flow together. Now, one color has to do with the wickedness of the tribe of Judah and even referring back to the wickedness of Israel and why they are going into captivity. So I've kind of marked that every time I find that in one color. I want to point out that they were given so many opportunities to change and the Lord pled with them to return, but this is how they responded. We need to see how previous Israel acted that led them into the captivity. The second color I would mention is the God that is pleading with them, the attributes that you find where he is talking about himself, anything that has to do with him and his nature and his pleadings and what he has wanted to do would be a second color. Then the third color is the prophecies of our day. Now, I know you could read Jeremiah and say he's prophesying of the return of Jerusalem and New Testament times, but if you read the prophecy, the only group that truly fulfills these prophecies are the Latter-day Saints. So yes, I recognize that he's talking about a return from Babylon, rebuilding the very same city on the heaps of the old city. But he's really, to me, talking about the Latter-day Saints. He's talking about the restoration of the gospel in the latter days. And so that's my third color. He'll often use words like, in the days to come, or in that day, or at that time. And those seem to be kind of triggers that he's prophesying about a righteous group of Israel that will learn from all of the mistakes of the past and finally be the people that the Lord wants us to be. And then there's a fourth color when you focus on Jeremiah himself, what's happening to him. Jeremiah is a marvelous character as he's going through these prophecies of their destruction and of a Latter-day triumph. And so lessons we learn from the prophet himself are valuable to pay attention to. So that's my fourth color. Okay, so before we jump into it, Bryce and I just want to acknowledge at the front We are not going sequentially through chapters 20 through 52, but we did put together an outline in the show notes where you can go and you can see sequentially the events in these chapters. You know, maybe you're sitting here at home saying, I've never really understood Jeremiah. Like, who's the king? What's going on? What is the main message? And so that's what we tried to do on paper. But just know that in this podcast, we can't hit on all those. And so what Bryce and I are going to do is we're going to go back and forth and look at some themes. We're going to look at some of the symbolic actions of Jeremiah. I love the list that Bryce put forth where we're going to look at his experiences, his prophecies, the attributes of God. Of course, I'm going to get into some of the events historically. Like what are these events that are framing the greater theological message of Jeremiah? And so we'll see these and we'll look at these, but we are going to jump around. So bear with us. It's just the nature of the beast as we try to cover 32 chapters plus lamentations in about an hour. So I want to start with what I think is one of the great themes that flows out of all of these Old Testament prophets. We saw it so much in Isaiah and so much in Jeremiah, and that is the triumph of the Latter-day Saints, the triumph of restored Israel. So I'm going to go through first and make a list of things that Jeremiah prophesies regarding the qualities of Israel in the latter days. What kind of people does Jeremiah prophesy we would be? Now, there's the gauntlet. Jeremiah watched his own people go into captivity because of wickedness, and he saw through his Syriac eyes a people that would not do that, and he describes us in beautiful language. So, starting in chapter 30, notice in verse 3, for lo, the days come, And that's going to kind of be our indicator that we're now jumping into the future. He's actually going to, at the very end of chapter 30, mention that in the latter days, ye shall consider it. So all of this is future to Jeremiah, but I think present to us. And in describing us, 
here's my list of qualities that he sees in restored Israel. So starting in verse 18, he says towards the end, the city shall be builded upon her own heap and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and a voice of them that make merry. I think quality number one on this list of what Jeremiah saw is he saw a thankful people. He saw a group of Israelites who are thankful, thankful for their history, thankful for the lessons that have been learned, but thankful for what has come to them in their day. They are thankful. And then I would add this other one, verse 22, ye shall be my people and I will be your God. That's going to be repeated several times in Jeremiah. And I think the quality here is that our personalities are trying their very best to match his personality, that we are distinguished as God's people. We want to be known as God's people. So adding to that, I thought of this verse in the Book of Mormon where the anti-Nephi-Lehi's who were born Lamanites wanted so very badly to be distinguished as people of God. In Alma chapter 27, verse 27, it says, they were among the people of Nephi and also numbered among the people who were of the church of God. And they were also distinguished for their zeal towards God and also towards man. For they were perfectly honest and upright in all things, and they were firm in the faith, even unto the end. In other words, when Jeremiah prophesies that we are the Lord's people, I think we need to be known as those who are striving to be distinguished as his people. We have placed the image of God in our countenance so that when people see us to the degree that we can, they see him, that we act like him. We talk like him. We love what he loves. We do what he does. That to me is what Jeremiah is seeing, that we are going to be to the best that we possibly can, the people of God. I want to add one here since we're in this chapter. Look at verse three. In verse three of chapter 30, Jeremiah says, for lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. This is an important verse because Israel is in the rear window. They've been gone for 120 years. They're scattered. They're in the past. But yet Jeremiah sees Israel and Judah coming back together. Now, my take on this is I really do see this connected to Ezekiel, where Ezekiel sees the two sticks. We'll talk about that next week when we get into Ezekiel, but that's a big deal to Jeremiah, where he sees not just the people of Judah coming back, but Israel. It's a beautiful prophecy. Yeah. And that leads me to the very last verse of chapter 30, until he has performed the intents of his heart. I think the idea here is that we want in our heart to have what God has in his heart. That's what will make us the people of God, is when I love others the way God loves them, when I want for me what God wants for me, when I want for you what God wants for you, that we need to perform the intents of his heart. Yeah. Before we leave chapter 30, look in verse 9 and 10. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore fear thou not, my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. I see in one way to read this a promise of a return to the land, but in another way that a Davidic king will be there with them to protect them. For me, I see this as David, their king, being a prophecy of Jesus. And we are his people, and he is with us. I love as we move into chapter 31 that the focus in verse 1 becomes on family. He says in verse 1, At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel. I think it's significant in speaking of restored Israel that the focus is on family. 
And he's talking about Judah and Israel coming back and being a family, but that we are focused on our families. Next on my list, I would go to verse 12 of chapter 31. What does Jeremiah see in us? I love this idea of flowing together to the goodness of the Lord. I think he's describing a people that he sees as being good. And then later in verse 12, he describes us as watered gardens. Now, the image that comes to my mind when he says that is Alma 32, that we have planted a seed inside of us, and as it grows, we have the choice to either nourish or neglect. And those who nourish that seed so that it comes to fruit, the fruit is what we eat. I grow a tree that produces fruit that feeds me and fills me, and that when I have fruit to eat, when the tree of life within me is full of fruit, especially for those dark days where trial and tribulation come, and I have fruit to eat to get me through it, that's the image I have of being a watered garden, meaning we have deep roots, we have nourished our seed, and we have food and fruit to eat. Another beautiful quality of Latter-day Saints is in verse 31 of chapter 31. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made in the past. In other words, there's this tie to the past, but a break away from it. We don't necessarily have to be burdened by who we've been in the past, that God makes a new covenant with us every single time, that we as Latter-day Saints have received a new covenant, but that if you came from a family line where they have not lived the law of God, he makes with you a new covenant, that we have refreshed, rejuvenated commitments to God. We're tied to the past but we have made new covenants. Starting in verse 33, he says, but this shall be the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. In other words, Our ancestors, the ones that wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, were a stiff-necked people, and they had to have the law written on stone tablets. But in the latter days, he is calling for us to be the kind of people that has the law written in the fleshy tables of their heart, that he has placed his law inside of us, in our hearts, I don't obey the law because I have to, and I do it grudgingly. I obey the law because it is written into the very fiber of my being, and I want to do it. I think President Ezra Taft Benson, as quoted by Donald Staley in April of 1998, said it well. In describing the kind of people we should be, President Benson said, when obedience ceases to be an irritant and becomes our quest, in that moment, God will endow us with power. And I see Jeremiah looking through his Syriac eyes and seeing that kind of people, a people on whom the law is written on their hearts. And then verse 34, a beautiful description of the Latter-day Saints, or at least it should be the Latter-day Saints. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor, or maybe better rendered would, they shall need to teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord. Why? For they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. In other words, the distinguishing characteristic that Jeremiah saw when he looked at us was that we would know the Lord, that we become the kind of people that each one of us individually know him. One of my absolute favorite words in the Book of Mormon is in 2 Nephi 33, verse 6, where Nephi says, I glory in plainness, I glory in truth, I glory in my 
Jesus. Mormon will say that for himself in 3 Nephi chapter 5, that he glories in his God and his Savior. I love that description of who we need to be. Let me add just a couple more. Chapter 32, verse 39, is very reminiscent of Enoch's people and Moses 7. Verse 39, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. He saw that we would be people of one heart, that we would follow his way, that his way would be our way and that we would be knit together in love. I hear echoes of the city of Enoch where they were of one heart and one mind and no poor among them because they cared for each other. I think that's very significant that Jeremiah uses those very words. A couple more in chapter 33. In verse 11 of 33, the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, The voice of them that shall say, praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. What he seems to be seeing is a happy, joyful people who love life. Now, do they have challenges? Absolutely. But can they find joy in those challenges? Can they say, praise the Lord of hosts? I think every one of us need to echo what Joseph Smith said right after he came out of the sacred grove. He went home to see his mother and said three of the most glorious words, all is well. Now, if you know the economic situation of the Smith family at that moment, you could make an argument that all was not well. But Joseph, after what he saw in that grove of trees that morning, is saying, all is well. That's the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of them that say, praise the Lord. The Lord is good. It's an optimistic, happy people he's describing. Now, you and I all face challenges, and there will be numerous challenges that come to Joseph Smith and the saints. But because of what happened in that grove of trees— Because of the restoration that has begun in our day, every one of us, in spite of our challenges, can find joy and gladness and praise and say, the Lord is good. Uh, Verse 14 of that same chapter 33, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel. He calls the restoration that good thing. Do you view your membership in the church? Do you view the Book of Mormon and its restoration as that good thing? I am part of something good. I'm excited about it. We should be a happy, excited, joyful people who can say, even in our challenges, all is well. Now, just one more idea in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 33, he gives us a name. He gives us a title, and I love the title. I try my very best to live up to this title. In verse 15 of 33, he says, In those days, at that time, will I cause the branch of righteousness. And notice in the King James Version, it's a capital B branch. That's a title. We are the branch of righteousness and that the Lord is causing us to grow up unto David. And then in verse 16, he kind of gives us a similar but very different title. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely, and this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. That's the title of restored Israel, the branch of righteousness the Lord our righteousness. And so I think put all of these together and see the vision of what he saw when Israel would be restored in the latter days, and let that be an invitation to be that people, to be the branch of righteousness, to be grateful and thankful, to be joyful, to see the restoration as that good thing, the best thing that's ever happened to me, No matter what happens, with Joseph, I can say, all is well. I like that. I think that's important. 
Okay, let's tackle a couple other things. Right after verse 16, Jeremiah 33, 17 says, For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. I know that that prophecy can be really difficult because perhaps in Jeremiah's day to his contemporaries, they thought, oh, we're always going to have a Davidic king. And that could lead some people to say, oh, we're not going to be captured or the king and his line will never be taken from the throne. But we know that did happen. And so I like to take Jeremiah 33 and in my scriptures, I cross-reference this with 2 Samuel 7 verse 16. Now, if you remember, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we have Nathan the prophet, and he comes up to David, and look what he says in verse 16. Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And that idea of the inviolability of the house of David is a continuing piece of Old Testament theology that carries itself forward into the New Testament era. You see, the authors of the New Testament books saw this prophecy as true being fulfilled in Christ. And so Jesus, as a son of David or a descendant of the Davidic line, carries on that prophecy. And so I think Jeremiah 33 verse 17 holds true in that sense, that David shall never want for a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Why? Because it's Jesus. And I really like that reading there. And I think this is really important, especially tied back into this idea of the branch of righteousness, because that title also is attached to Jesus Christ. Adding to that, Another really important message that Jeremiah gives is in the 27th chapter. Essentially, he puts on a yoke, and the Lord tells him to do it. In verse 2, the Lord said to me, make thee bonds and yokes and put them on thy neck. So then Jeremiah wears a yoke, and he comes to Zedekiah, and all of Zedekiah's prophets— and, and by the way, prophets is used in the text of Jeremiah as a professional guild of prophets. And we don't think this way. When we think prophets, we think, oh, there's true prophets. Well, the prophets or the prophetic guild. It's kind of like King Noah and his priests. Yes. That were put in place to give him counsel so that he heard what he wanted to say. That's very opposed to Abinadi, which is the Lord's prophet. Yeah, I think that's perfect. These men of this prophetic school or prophetic guild worked in the king's court, and their message is everything's going to be okay, and Jeremiah's message is no, everything's not going to be okay. And remember, the tension, really the underlying tension here is Egypt. Egypt is sending messages to the Jews saying, hey, ally with us, and we'll kind of team up against Babylon, and that's kind of the temptation. And Zedekiah is really considering not paying tribute to Babylon, and so Jeremiah stands before him and he says, don't listen to those guys. Go to verse 17, where Jeremiah says, hearken not unto them, meaning those false prophets, and serve the king of Babylon and live. Just surrender. And then in the 28th chapter, there's one of Zedekiah's prophets, and he says, everything's going to be great. His name is Hananiah, and he kind of gets into a match with Jeremiah and they kind of throw down. If you look in verse 10 of chapter 28, Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet's neck, off Jeremiah's neck, and he brake it. And Hananiah spake in the presence of everyone. And he said, thus saith the Lord, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from off the neck of all nations within the space of two years. And so he gives his prophetic message, and then Jeremiah comes back and says, no, that's not right. In fact, not only are you wrong, verse 16 of chapter 28, Hananiah, you're going to die this year. And then verse 17, we read that that happens. Hananiah the prophet dies the same year in the seventh month. Now, my take on this as I read this is I think, okay, how is that like the day that we live in today? We have a prophet, and maybe he gives messages that aren't always comfortable, or maybe they're difficult to handle, and yet there's always a counter voice. And you have to navigate this world and distinguish between these voices. And what's interesting in these chapters is the kings of Judah really struggle. On one hand, they listen to Jeremiah, but on the other hand, they're throwing him in prison. And it really does remind me of the experience that King Noah had with Abinadi, where on one hand, Abinadi's voice has weight and the king hears it and he can feel it. But on the other hand, he has all these other voices. Mike, it reminds me of Joseph Smith's definition of a true friend. 
when he was 17 years old and was waiting for more communication, waiting for Moroni to come, he says that he fell into many foolish errors because he didn't have the right kind of friends. He didn't have the kind of people that would have done what true friends do. And then he gives this incredible definition. So this is Joseph Smith history, verse 28. Being of very tender years and persecuted by those who ought to have been my friends and to have treated me kindly, and if they suppose me deluded, to have endeavored in a proper and affectionate manner to have reclaimed me. I love that definition of a true friend. They treat you kindly, but if they think you're going astray, they find a proper and affectionate way to save you. True friends won't turn their back and say nothing while you destroy your life. A true friend will stop you from hurting yourself. And sometimes prophets are our truest friend. Sometimes mom and dad are our truest friend. And yet we don't like to hear what they're saying because it's painful to hear. But what they're really doing is endeavoring in a proper and affectionate manner to reclaim us from a pain we're headed towards. Now, that being said, Mike, maybe our next theme are to talk about Jeremiah's friends and who helped Jeremiah get through this time period. Yeah. So let's talk about two people that really save his life. Go to chapter 26 of Jeremiah. And I'm just going to read the chapter heading. Like I said, we're skipping a lot, but here it is. Jeremiah prophesies the destruction of the people. For this, he is arraigned, tried, and then acquitted. The 26th chapter of Jeremiah really does lay out that there's this plot to kill him. So in the first 19 verses, there's an attempt to kill him. And then there's a plot to kill another guy in chapter 26, verses 20 through 24. And his name is Urijah. And in the midst of these assassination plot, we read this in the 26th chapter, verse 24. Nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shephan, was with Jeremiah, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. Big picture, without reading the whole chapter, is in the midst of this plot, there is this individual, Ahikam, which comes to Jeremiah, and he's connected to this man named Shephan. We geek about it in the show notes if you want to get into the political things happening with this family. This family and their house are very kind to Jeremiah. And this individual in verse 24 saves Jeremiah's life from this assassination plot that's kind of laid out in the 26th chapter. Then we have another example of a friend that pulls Jeremiah out of a pit. His name is Ebed Melech, and that word is a combination of a couple words. Ebed means servant or slave, and Melech means king. So Ebed Melech is a great name for someone who's the servant of the king. It mentions in the text of Jeremiah 38 that he's a Cushite, and a Cushite is an individual from Africa, from Nubia. Mike, I think it's interesting that a foreigner saves him. Yeah. Kind of like the Samaritan who showed mercy to the Jew who fell among thieves, but the very priests and the Levites that walked by wouldn't show their mercy. I think that's a rebuke on Jeremiah shouldn't have needed to be saved by a foreigner. He should have been saved by someone within the very house of Israel, his own people. I think that's a very significant comment and flows right into that parable of the Good Samaritan. Yeah. It's a difficult circumstance. We're still kind of talking about his message. Like, what is his message? If you look in verse 2, this is what's going to get him in trouble. Thus saith the Lord, he that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live. So Jeremiah is saying, if you go, you surrender to Babylon, the Chaldeans, for he shall have his life for a prey, and he shall live. And that's not the best translation, but essentially what Jeremiah 38 verse 2 is saying is, you guys are going to live if you surrender. And then Jeremiah says in the next verse, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will take it. And then the princes, the people that are in charge, say, we've got to put him to death. And so Zedekiah says, you know what? He's in your hand. You can take him. And so in verse six, they cast him into a dungeon. And it says there's nothing in there but mire. And so Jeremiah was sunk in the mire. And it's at this point when Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, as it says in the King James or the Cushite, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, he petitions the king. And he says, you know what? We've got to save him out of the pit. We've got to pull him out. 
And I think about that a lot. Uh, you know, what is a good friend? And are you a, are you somebody that would stand up to somebody, a bully, even if everybody is on the bully side, but you know what's right? What kind of friend are you? And so it's in this experience, in Jeremiah being confined in this dark place, that he's rescued. So Abed melech verse 8, went forth to the king's house, and he said in verse 9, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they've done to Jeremiah the prophet, and they've cast him into a dungeon. And he is to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. And so the king responds, and he says in verse 10, to take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. And so they do. Ebed melech in verse 11 and 12, they go and they bring together these really old rags, and they kind of make a rope, and they pull him up, verse 13, out of the dungeon. And so then it says that Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison at this time. And I really like that story, and it's it's a very difficult story, but it really does remind me of the Savior going down into the underworld where he's in the spirit world for three days. Um, it's also indicative of so many examples in the hero's journey, where the hero, as part of his journey, has to go through the darkest abyss to rise up on top. And Jeremiah's words are vindicated. Time always vindicates the prophets, and Jeremiah is an example of this, where everything that he says to Zedekiah comes to pass. If you go back to chapter 27 and you read the words of what he says, and you read the front part of Jeremiah 38, that's his message, that you guys need to surrender to Babylon, and yet it's so offensive to his listeners. I mean, if you look in 37 verse 18, Jeremiah said to King Zedekiah, what have I offended against thee? or against thy servants, or against this people. And sometimes the prophets do. They say words that are just difficult to hear, but it really was what he needed to hear. The words of Jeremiah, if they would have been listened to by Zedekiah, would have been beneficial to his family. But unfortunately, he doesn't listen. I like that theme, Mike. I like that theme of friendship. And I know that I owe a lot to the friends in my life who have both literally and symbolically pulled me out of a pit. And I love to read that we're in this together. Let me throw in another theme. As you're mar- if you're marking in these three colors and you're marking a color that shows God and what he's doing behind the scenes, this whole time period is a trial for Israel. They're going to go into captivity. Many will be killed. It is a tough time. In chapter 31, kind of couched in the theme that Rama would lament for her children. That verse is going to be quoted when Herod destroys the children at the birth of Jesus. He's going to quote that verse that Rama was lamenting and bitter weeping. Rachel, for the loss of her children, refused to be comforted. We're all going to have those moments. We're all going to have those moments where we weep in bitterness of soul. But book ending that verse in verse 15 is this beautiful insight about the Savior, a promise he makes. Starting in verse 13, then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old. Why? For I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. I will satiate the soul of the priest with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness. I'm going to repeat that to every one of you who are struggling and suffering. When you're not quite to the fourth watch and you're rowing your boat in darkness, when you are, Rachel, refusing to be comforted because of a painful experience, It is my testimony and the promise God gives us that my people shall be satisfied with my goodness. In the end, we will all acknowledge that he was good and kind and that we wept for a while, but he made us rejoice from our sorrow. He picks that up in verse 16. I'm still in chapter 31, but verse 16, thus saith the Lord. This is right after quoting Rachel and Rama in lamentation and weeping. He says, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, 
saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. Now, speaking of Rachel losing her children, they shall come again from the land of thy enemy, and there is hope in thine end. Putting those two statements together, verse 14, my people shall be satisfied with my goodness. And then verse 17, there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord. That is his promise to you, that there is hope in thine end. I want to end this theme with just this beautiful prophecy in our, in our modern-day scriptures. Doctrine and Covenant section 90, verse 24, search diligently, pray always, and be believing, and all things shall work together for your good. If you walk uprightly and remember the covenant wherewith you have covenanted one with another, we will all be satisfied with his goodness. Yeah. Now, in the 32nd chapter of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is imprisoned by Zedekiah. Now, we talked about this in the context of him being rescued by Ebed Melech, being pulled out of the dungeon, but it's important to know that he's in prison in the 10th year of the reign of King Zedekiah. That's what we read. That's 588 BC to 587 BC, right in there. That's a year before the Babylonian army invades Judah the second time to put down the Judean revolt, destroy the temple, sack the city, and imprison Zedekiah. Now we're going to read later that Zedekiah and his seed are going to be killed. We know from the Book of Mormon that one of his sons, Mulek, is able to escape and his people go to the Americas. And they live in this place called Zarahemla. And that group of people that we commonly call Mulekites are a core group of people that unite with the people of Nephi. And then collectively, those two groups come together and they become the Nephites. And so the people of Zarahemla in the Book of Mormon are the descendants of Mulek and a small colony of individuals that are able to escape the destruction in 586, the destruction of Jerusalem, the same destruction that Nephi escapes earlier, one of Zedekiah's sons is able to escape. And the Bible doesn't tell us this story. We pick this up in the Book of Mormon. And so knowing this and knowing that we're talking about Zedekiah in chapter 32, once again, the backdrop to this chapter is Jeremiah's in prison. And then we have this really interesting passage, and it can be a little bit confusing. Verse 8, it says, So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord. And he said unto me, By my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Verse 9, And I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even seventeen shekels of silver. What's happening here? What's the point of Jeremiah purchasing this land? You see, not only does he purchase the land, but he's given specific instructions. He's to put the documentation of the land purchase in an earthen jar, seal it with pitch, and then we read, for this land will again be possessed by our descendants. That's Jeremiah 32 verses 14 and 15. One commentator explained it this way. God's command to purchase a family plot in Ananoth is another example of the symbolic actions found in this book. We talked about last week some of the symbolic actions of Jeremiah. If you remember, there was the earthen bottle that he threw down and it was crushed. Uh, that was in chapters 19 and 20. And the earthen bottle represented the walls of Jerusalem that the Lord would crush them. We also talked about the linen girdle that he buried at Euphrates and then it was tattered and that was in chapter 13. We talked about the potter's wheel in the 18th chapter, where the Lord says, I'm the potter and you are the clay and I can mold you. We talked about all the different symbolic actions, and this is one of them, but it's kind of disguised. So God's command to purchase a family plot in Ananoth is another example of the symbolic actions found in this book. You see, long ago in the days of Abraham, God gave the patriarch Abraham the land. We read this in Genesis 23 as, as well as in other places. And yet when Jeremiah is really old, he purchases a place for his wife, Sarah, to be buried, and he really doesn't have the land yet. And so what makes this 
command difficult for Jeremiah to act on is that there's almost complete and total certainty that Nebuchadnezzar is going to get into the city. You see, he's almost in. It's like right before he gets in. And so we know the land's going to be taken by the Babylonians. So why are we purchasing land? Like, what's the point of investing in land when the army's at the doors and they're about to take the land? And so we read that back in Jeremiah chapter 12, we heard about Jeremiah's relatives, where his own relatives in Anathoth were trying to find a way to kill Jeremiah. They wanted to take him out. And so relatives back home want to kill him, and yet he's in jail, and one of his relatives comes to him and says, I need you to redeem my land. You see, the law for a kinsman to redeem any land that is likely to pass out of control of the family is in place. Let's say I'm about to lose my family land. It needs to be redeemed by a near kinsman to keep it in the family. So one way to read this is that it appears that a member of Jeremiah's family has come to him basically with his hat in his hand. And he's like, listen, I need you to redeem the land. And this could be a sign that we have this unrecorded reconciliation with the family that the very family that wanted to kill Jeremiah is now reconciled to him. And they're coming to him saying, please redeem the land. It could indicate this. And it could show us that this individual is eating humble pie, coming to him and saying, you know what? We need your help, Jeremiah. It's really not clear, but we do know that it's Jeremiah's right to redeem it as the near kinsman. Now, I find this fascinating on several levels. On one level, I read this as, this is a symbolic action. What Jeremiah is essentially saying is, I know we're going to lose the land. I'm going to redeem it. We're going to seal it. I'm going to put it in a jar, and we will one day come back and get the land. On one level, that's awesome. On another level, I like it as a symbol for Christ. The very people that spit in his face and said, we hate you, we want to kill you, they're now coming to him. And he's their redeemer. He's the one that's able to fix it. How do you not see that as an image of Jesus? Now, this is where Isaiah said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't act that way. I'm not a mortal man with resentment in my heart. Even if you've spit in my face and then come back and apologize, I love you and I will covenant with you and be with you. That is Jesus to the core. Yeah, it's it's so good. And so we see this, and it's, it kind of gets lost. I'm, I'm not going to deny it. You read the King James of Jeremiah 32, and if you're reading it and you're like, what is going on? I totally get it. It's just written different, and it, it can be a challenge. And yet it's a beautiful story, and it's like hidden in plain sight because Jeremiah is a type of Christ, and he's in a position where he has the ability to redeem his family. So he redeems them. And then I love where it says in verse 14, take the evidences, put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue for many days. And I love that. And it's probably not the best translation how I would translate it, but I would essentially say verse 14, that's the book of life. That's section 128 where the Lord says, take the book, take the evidences, collect them, and we are going to present this as an acceptable offering to God. You see, the land is Israel. And that's why I love verse 15. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in the land. And then the end of verse 17, is anything too hard for the Lord? Why? Verse 18, you've shown your chesed, you've shown your loving kindness unto thousands. Verse 19, because you're great in counsel, mighty in work. I love chapter 32. I think it's so cool, but I also acknowledge it's just so weird. It's just outside of our culture, but it's a beautiful image of Jeremiah, who that man was. Yep. Okay, let's tackle a couple other things. Go to chapter 35. I know it's not in this week's Come Follow Me, but in chapter 35, Jeremiah meets with a group of people, and they're called the Rechabites. And it might sound a little bit strange, like what's going on here? Let's talk about who the Rechabites are briefly. The Rechabites are a group of people that left Jerusalem after the king who succeeded Josiah purged them out of the temple around 621 BC. And... This king tried to persuade them to abandon their way of life. We put a ton of stuff in the show notes for you if you're interested in this, but know that the Rechabites are living outside of the temple, but they're a group of holy people. 
One scholar says that the Druze, they're a group of people that live today in Lebanon, Syria, and Israel, that the Druze trace their lineage back to the Rechabites, back to that tradition. We have a really good quote from Hugh Nibley where he said this about the Rechabites. He says, in chapter 35... Jeremiah tested the integrity of the Rechabites, who were a very important people. Jeremiah 35 tells us how he dealt with them. They come out earlier in the history of Israel. This tells us that he set them up to the Jews as an example of integrity. The Rechabites are kind of held up as this example. The Rechabites were given a permanent position in the temple. And then Hugh Nibley makes this statement. He says, Lehi and his family were Rechabites. They joined that particular movement. They were the people who went out into the wilderness and tried to live the gospel in its purity out there. Wow, that's a powerful statement. And then Hugh Nibley finishes, chapter 35 of Jeremiah is the official history, you might say, of the Rechabites. Now, I don't know if Lehi was a Rechabite. The Book of Mormon certainly doesn't tell us this, but what the Book of Mormon does tell us is that Lehi's religion was in contradistinction to the religion that was practiced in Jerusalem, and the Rechabites are kind of in this state. Now, another scholar, Margaret Barker, said this, that the Rechabites were the ones who tried to save James when James's life was threatened. She says that the Rechabites left Jerusalem after the king who succeeded Josiah tried to come at them. She says they were called the Blessed Ones, they were dressed in garments of glory, and they offered prayer day and night. And then she says again, it was one of the Rechabites who tried to prevent the death of James, the leader of the Jerusalem Christians and a guardian of the secret tradition. A man, says Eusebius, universally regarded as the most righteous of men because of the heights of philosophy and religion which he scaled in his life. Now that's in Eusebius's history, speaking of James, and James had a really good reputation as being very pious and that he had connection with them. So knowing who they are a little bit, We kind of have a picture here. In this chapter, Jeremiah blesses them. And here's the blessing that he gives them. He says in verse 18, because you obeyed the commandment, the blessing now comes in verse 19. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. Now, that's not the best translation. I'm going to read this other alternate translation to kind of get our bearings as to what this promise is saying. Another translation reads as follows. Assuredly, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, there shall never cease to be a man of the line of Jonadab, son of Rechab, standing before me. In other words, this is a promise that this line will continue. Now, I like this for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons I like this is it shows us a group of pious Israelites living outside the temple. And if you read the chapter carefully, it talks a lot about how they're going to dwell in tents. They're not going to build houses. They're basically going to be out in the wilderness. And there are these pious believers outside of the temple and their promise that their line will continue. And so I, I kind of see what Hugh Nibley is saying, where he's like, this is pretty awesome stuff. This is a group of visionaries and they're on the outs and it's very similar to Lehi. So I like chapter 35. I guess what's really relevant to me is this idea That right in the Bible, we have a tradition of individuals that are trying to live their religion, and they're not aligned with the establishment of Jerusalem. I think that's why maybe, to me, it's relevant. Okay, so let's look at another thing. Um, Go to the 39th chapter of Jeremiah, and in this chapter, we read about the destruction of Jerusalem. It says, in the ninth year of the king of Judah, in the 10th month, came Nebuchadnezzar and they besieged the city of Jerusalem. That's chapter 39, verse 1. And then if you go to verse 6, it says, The king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes. He slew also all the nobles of Judah. And then verse 7 says, He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains and carried him to Babylon. That treatment by the king of Babylon to Zedekiah is because Zedekiah rebelled. He didn't pay tribute. He tried to align against Babylon politically, and that is why he was treated this way. And my take on chapter 39 is it didn't need to happen. If Zedekiah would have listened to Jeremiah, we wouldn't have Jeremiah chapter 39. Let's go to the 36th chapter. So now we're rewinding the clock. We have a different king on the throne. This is Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim is reigning from 609 to 598. Now just know when you read the book of Jeremiah, it's not chronological. 
So we've got Zedekiah early on in Jeremiah, we've got Zedekiah late in Jeremiah, and then we've got Jehoiakim here in 36, which is before Zedekiah. Yeah. So he's the king on the throne in what I like to call the first siege of Jerusalem, and then Zedekiah is the king on the throne in the second siege. And Jehoiakim and Zedekiah are brothers. These are sons of Josiah. So in the context of who the kings are, we have this story of Jeremiah giving a prophecy, and it's written down, and he's shut up, it says in verse 5, and there's a couple different ways to read it. Some read it as in he's in hiding. I think most scholars translate that and read that as he's incarcerated. He's in a situation where he can't get out. He's confined. However you read this, in this context, he gives a prophecy. He dictates it. We read in verse 4 that Baruch, his scribe, is going to write this Uh, this prophecy. And it's a second chance prophecy. It's so typical of the Lord. I'm not going to destroy until I've given you ample opportunity to change. And it's been foretold. And it's a second chance prophecy. It says, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I propose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil. And if they do, what's his promise? That I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. It's not too late, Jehoiakim. It's not too late, Judah. If you return to the Lord, we can prevent this. You can be my people. You can avoid these consequences if you change and repent. Now, before we get into the details of the 36th chapter, I just want to say this about Baruch. Many scholars look at Baruch, his scribe, as possibly the main editor of the Old Testament, at least up until this time period. Uh, One biblical scholar, Richard Freeman, wrote that Baruch— is probably the one who was the main, what's called the Deuteronomistic historian, meaning he took the the Torah scrolls and he edited them and kind of aligned them and put them together. I think in our vernacular as Latter-day Saints, I would liken Baruch unto Mormon, as in someone who did a lot of the editing and put things together. And if you're interested in kind of following this rabbit hole and reading more of the details, we give you in the show notes some things that you can go look, and there's some books that you can read about this. They've actually found in Jerusalem evidence of the historical man Baruch. They found a seal with his name on it that would have been used in official documents. And so it's kind of interesting as a side note just to say, no, this really was a historical person. And he probably did have some part to play in the construction of the Old Testament. I'm certainly open to this. I, I kind of lean towards it, but, you know, I don't know. So with that in mind, we read that Jeremiah dictates a prophecy. And we read in verse 7 that great is the anger of the fury of that the Lord has pronounced against this people. And so essentially what happens in this chapter is the scroll of the prophecy is taken, and it's taken before several different groups. It's taken by Baruch in chapter 36, verse 10, into the chamber of Gemariah. And remember, Gemariah, he is the son of Shaphan. He is a son of Josiah's secretary and the brother of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, who interceded in Jeremiah's behalf at his sedition trial back in chapter 26. So this is that family, this family of Shaphan that is closely associated with Jeremiah. So my take on this is that when this scroll is read, This is among friends. This is among people that are really close to Jeremiah. They support him. And so he reads it. And so then they say, we've got to take it to a second group. So a second group is now going to hear the scroll. And that's in verse 15. And my take on this is these are more powerful people. So we're kind of going up the chain of command. They respond when they hear it that they now have to take it to the king. If you look in verse 16, it says, It came to pass that they, when they heard the words, they were afraid, both one and the other, and they said to Baruch, We will surely tell these words to the king. So they're going to take it to the king, and they read the words, whatever those words are. Like, we don't have all the words, or maybe we do. Maybe the words on the scroll are other parts of Jeremiah. But whatever is on the scroll, verse 19 says, that the princes told Baruch, remember that's Jeremiah's scribe, go hide thee thou and Jeremiah and let no man know where ye be. In other words, they know this is going to be a hard message for the king to hear. He's probably not going to like it, 
But I think there's a hint here that they're hoping the king will hear the prophecy, repent, and come back to the Lord. I think this is kind of that group that's saying, we're going to take it to the king. They're hopeful that the king will hear the prophecy, change his ways, and return to the God of Israel. I agree, Bryce. I think these princes, at least in this story, could be an example of a good friend. A good friend's going to come to me and say, you know what, Mike, you're not going to like what I'm about to tell you. And sometimes the truth hurts, but you really need to hear this. And so they do. They, they bring it to the king. And so when they do, he, start, he gets out a knife and he starts cutting up the bits of the scroll and casting them in the fire. And several men beg him not to burn the scroll, but he does anyway. And then we read in chapter 36, verse 26, that King Jehoiakim orders the arrest of Baruch and Jeremiah. And then we read, quote, but the Lord hid them. And so the, then the Lord tells Jeremiah in chapter 36, verses 27 through 32, to get another scroll and more information is added to that scroll. And then we read in the 32nd verse of Jeremiah 36, there were added besides unto them many like words. But notice the words are a little bit different because this isn't a second chance prophecy. He sent a second chance. He said, change your ways and you can be saved. And now this new scroll includes some pretty harsh prophecies, like in verse 30, thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David and his dead body shall be cast out in the day of the heat and then the night of the, to the frost, and I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity. I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I have pronounced against them. In other words, this, the new scroll says, okay, I gave you a chance. I've given you many chances. I've pled with you numerous times, and now I draw the line. Now the destruction is coming. This chapter, to me, also opens up the idea of how Scripture is constructed. There's a prophecy, they write on it, and then perhaps it can be added to. I think as a Latter-day Saint, it's good to be open to that idea that Scriptures are produced in a context, in a time, and they deal with circumstances, and they can be edited, and they can be added uh, there too. And we talked a lot about this when we talked about the Doctrine and Covenants and some of the history of the construction of the Doctrine and Covenants. But right here in chapter 36, we have sitting right in front of us evidence of how Scripture was constructed. And frankly, <laughs> I'm going to say it, I think the king cutting stuff out he doesn't like is really what I see happening a lot in the Old Testament. I think there were things that prophets said that later editors are like, nope, we're taking that out and we're taking that out. And so I love chapter 36 in that context, understanding how it fits in the bigger picture of the production of scripture. Now, Bryce and I are going to skip the prophecies about other nations, as well as the incidents after the fall of Jerusalem. Chapter 40 through 44 talk about what happens in the land after the temple's destroyed, after the city is wrecked. And then chapters 46 through 51 are prophecies about other nations. And a lot of these oracles are very similar to the oracles against the nations that Isaiah gives. And so Bryce and I are not going to get into the weeds on those, but we do have an outline in the show notes for you if you're interested. So now let's jump into Lamentations we just kind of wanted to insert the lamentations in the middle so that we can end with the hope for the future of Israel. I think you'll catch the spirit of what Jeremiah is trying to do in the lamentations. If you kind of read Mormon chapter six, where he looks out after the destruction of his people and he just says, oh, ye fair ones, how could you have departed from the ways of the Lord? And you just sense that heartbrokenness of the loss of his people. And he does say, and I think this is the point of Jeremiah's Lamentations, how could you have rejected that Jesus who stood with open arms to receive you? Had you not done this, you would not have fallen. I mourn your loss. So it's kind of framed historically, probably after the exile, and did Jeremiah write it? You know, it depends on who you read. It, it doesn't matter. But the idea is this, this deep abiding lament, hence the name. I mean, if you look in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 48, mine eye runneth down with the rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. It really is 
repeatedly affirming their faith in God, even though they've been punished for their sins. And essentially, the author of Lamentations is saying, in the end, we're going to be redeemed. And there's even some stuff in there on, hey, our enemies are going to get theirs. There's also this hope of the future. And so I just wanted to throw in this beautiful verse in the Book of Mormon from Ether 12, which is Moroni watching the destruction of the Jaredites and has the same thing. He's mourning the loss of the Jaredites, but has this hope for the future. And he says, wherefore, this is Ether 12, 4, wherefore, whoso believeth in God might with surety hope for a better world, even a place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works. I think that underlying these lamentations is Jeremiah saying that he has a hope for a better world, and that that hope is his anchor that keeps him bound to God. Yeah, I really think that's a great overview of the Book of Lamentations. So after hearing his lamentations and his mourning over their loss, let's get back to some of the joyful things that Jeremiah sees for the future of Israel. So let me take you back to the beginning of this year as we talked about Abraham, that Heavenly Father wants to bless all of his children. So he picks someone as his representative. And I'm going to bless you and give you the tools that you need so that you can now bless all of my children. That's the Abrahamic covenant. It was given from Abraham to Isaac. So Isaac, you're now my chosen one. I will bless you so that you have the resources that you need to bless everyone else. It was given from Isaac to Jacob. Jacob passed it to Joseph. Joseph passed it to Ephraim. And then it kind of disappeared, right? We haven't seen the Abrahamic covenant. It certainly wasn't passed on. So one might ask the question, did the Abrahamic covenant just die? Or does it continue? Especially now that Israel has been taken captive by the Assyrians and Judah is about to go into captivity into Babylon. So what happened to the Abrahamic covenant, and where is it? So turn to Jeremiah chapter 31, and as you hear these words, ask yourself, who is modern-day Ephraim? Who is he talking about? You may want to think about your patriarchal blessing and the vast majority of the members of the church. I know we have people from all tribes, but the majority of the church is from the tribe of Ephraim right now. So the Lord begins in chapter 31 saying, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, all of the tribes of Israel. Verse 3, he says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. He doesn't give up on us. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. I will build thee, and thou shalt be built. Even in Samaria, verse 5, they're going to be built the watchman upon the Mount of Ephraim. Now, this is a hundred plus years after the destruction of the northern tribes that took Ephraim. But the Lord says, I will place watchmen upon Mount Ephraim. Verse 7, sing with gladness for Jacob and shout among the chief of the nations, publicly praise ye and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Then we get to verse 9, they shall come with weeping, and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble, for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. It's still intact. The Abrahamic covenant is still intact, and Ephraim as a tribe, not as a person, but Ephraim as a tribe is his birthright, and they're the ones. And what is Ephraim going to do? Verse 10, the primary mission of Ephraim, he that scattered Israel will gather him. That's Ephraim's job. And so we get to verse 20, is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? I think what he's saying is even today, even as Israel seems to be taken, as Judah is about to be taken, all seems lost. But is Ephraim still my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? Do I think about him pleasantly? Do I love him? 
And then this beautiful prophecy, let everyone on planet earth hear, for since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. It is still the Lord's intention in the book of Jeremiah when Israel seems to be scattered. It is the Lord's intention that Ephraim will bring everyone home. And as a side note, when Lehi leaves, Lehi's from Manasseh, but his sons marry descendants of Ephraim. And so the Book of Mormon story does carry that idea that the Lord knows who these Israelites are. And, and the Lord tells him when we get to Third Nephi, the Lord is looking at them and he says, you are the seed of Israel. Now, who is Ephraim today? As you think about your own patriarchal blessing and our collective patriarchal blessings, let's finish in chapter 50, a beautiful prophecy. Verse 4, in those days. Again, how many times does Jeremiah say, in that day, in those days, it shall come to pass. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come. And they and the children of Judah together, that's Israel and Judah, coming back together, going and weeping. They shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Do you see who you are? Do you understand what you are a part of? Jeremiah took great consolation and comfort as he looked at his own people who were going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. He took great comfort in knowing that Israel and Judah would find their way back home. That is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and our mission on this earth, to gather Israel back home. And Ephraim and Manasseh, the tribe of Joseph, are the primary ones who will gather Israel. So Ephraim has gathered and is gathering the rest of the tribes. I want to end in Doctrine and Covenants section 133, which was intended to be the appendix. We gave it a, a section number, which is great. This was given at the same time as section one, which is the preface, and section 133 is the appendix. Starting in verse 29 of section 133, and in the barren desert shall there come forth pools of living water, and the parched ground shall no longer be a thirsty land, and they shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Ephraim, my servants. And the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence, and there shall they fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion, by the hands of of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim. That is our assignment in the grand scheme of things, to restore Israel and bring them home. And with that, we thank you for listening. We will see you next week when we cover the book of Ezekiel, a book written by a prophet that lived with the Jews during the time of captivity. Make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions. <laughs>